Thank you. So basically, most of the work has already been done, so that's nice for me. <laughs> that's cool. But I will still uh, introduce you for misunderstanding that we often have when we think about big data. So these are the four misunderstandings. Four plus one is actually four <coughs> because we don't have the time for the plus ones. Let's keep that one. Um, the first one is that. When we are talking about big, big, big data, in fact, the first wrong thing is that we are not, most of the time, we are not actually talking about data. We are talking about something else. We are talking about traces. Basically, what we do, and it has been said uh, already, is that we use the little traces that basically us uh, and, and the objects that we use live in digital media to extract information or sense from them. Uh, a little bit like the, you know, the little birds following Ansel and Gretel and eating, eating little breadcrumbs, exploiting the little breadcrumbs and Ansel and Gretel left for themselves to find the way back, the way back home. But that distinction between traces and data is actually very important because data and traces have completely different, a completely different nature. And the first important thing that we tend to forget when we don't make this distinction is that the data that we are talking about are not produced for the academia. Not for the social sciences, not for the natural sciences. For the most, they are produced for various reasons related to surveillance or technical efficiency or uh, economic exchange, etc., etc. So when we say, and it's often said, Big data is making, or digital technology are making data less expensive for the academia. This is not actually true. What they are doing is that, in fact, they are shifting the cost of collecting and producing those traces and those data to someone else. The people or the companies that manage and handle these digital networks. And that is important. This, for example, is a cap it shows you the um, cable industry investment who actually paid for a good share of you know, data revolution um, and it's actually a, an, an interesting controversy about this image because if you um, which also shows you how you can easily sort of lie with data and the way you present them uh, to connect with the last presentation is actually very important this uh, is the um, community unadjusted data but if you but uh, if you represent them the right way, uh, which means you deinflate the investment and you show the investment year per year, not the cumulative, you see that it's not actually growing through time, it's actually declining a little bit. Just to give you an example of how the way you present data can make a, an important difference. But it's more than that. Uh, when we work with digital traces, we have to always to keep in mind that they have been created by someone else with other with other, with, with objectives that might be different from ours. And so the condition of creation of these traces are very important. I, I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, we were working at, at the Media Lab, where I work in Paris, with uh, Google, what is called Google Trends, or Google Insight for Search, which is um, a very interesting set of data that Google generously uh, give out for free, um, but in a strange way. Um, about the researches, that are the queries that are made to a search engine. Right, so you can take whatever word you want to Google Trends, uh, like, I don't know, uh, soccer, and they will tell you how many people have searched for that word in the last days, in the last weeks, in the last years. And you can break it down to different parts of the world. So we were working with an economist. It, as you probably know, it has been used to build up pretty controversial but still pretty good indicator of flu spread around the world because people look for their symptoms so it can be used uh, in real time to detect the spreading of influenza pandemic in the world. So we were thinking about trying to do the same thing uh, for economic indicators, so matching uh, search queries in Google with economic indicators. And while we were doing some you know, literature analysis, we found this very interesting discussion paper by Skitter and Zimmerman where they show that there's actually a very, very good correlation between uh, the unemployment rate, uh, which is the 
the black line here in the US and the search for um, antidepressors um, side effects, antidepressor medicine side effects. So there's a lot of people that if you take how many people typing I don't know, Zoloft side effect, for example, and you match it with employment rates, it sort of correlates very well. And so they make the hypothesis, which kind of makes sense. Uh, that this, of course, is the, you know, the start of the, the crisis, the economic crisis in 2008. So they made the hypothesis that this could be used, uh, the search for antidepressor side effects could be used as an indicator uh, of unemployment because people lose their jobs, so they're depressed, so they take antidepressants, so they look for the side effects. But then we try to reproduce those results, and it works, but we also find out that there were a lot of other words that sort of had the same <laughs> curve. <laughs> for example, template, this is actually Google Trends. Um, for example, templates. It also spikes up starting from the end of 2008. So we thought, what? And recipe as well. A lot of these <laughs> sort of <laughs> side words. Um, and in fact, then what we discovered is that the, what happened is that in August 25, 2008, Google introduced a suggest feature. So now when you type Zoloft, Google proposes you side effect. When you type uh, apple pie, it proposes you recipe. Right? And so all these sort of side words spike up starting at more or less at the same time of the economic crisis. But so the, the correlation is very... But if, if you forget that those queries are made through Google, and so the condition of the production of those data depends on the technical infrastructure that collect those traces, you can easily miss this, you can easily miss this, this little but important distinction. And this is another example we are working on, uh, but we go very fast, but we are working on a project called Contropedia, where we use uh, data on Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia edits, to detect a controversial topic. So basically, when, when we see there are pages that are very much reverted uh, by different people, we sort of take that as an indicator of, um, of controversy or debate. Uh, but we are very, very aware that all the time there's a problem, what are we mapping here? What are we seeing? Are we seeing the, are we seeing the media or are we seeing the content? Are we actually seeing uh, some societal debate or are we seeing something about Wikipedia? Are we learning something about society or are we learning something about Wikipedia? And often we are learning more about Wikipedia than about society. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion that are going on about Wikipedia that are very, very, very specific to the bureaucratic format of this encyclopedia, but it does not really relate to what happened in society. So here's a few uh, articles that I've wrote on this, in case you're interested. Um, so the second misunderstanding, which is probably more important, is that quantity is less interesting than variety is not that variety. Um, do you know what happened to Google in September, 25 September 2015? Can you spot the difference? This is September, to, this is 24 September 2005, and this is uh, September, so two, two days later. Something is different, you know, apart from the cake, uh, which is the birthday of uh, what? Google itself, I guess. Sorry? No, that's not that. 2005, yeah. 2005. It's September 2005. Yeah, it becomes the same. 2005. The what? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the Google. That, like, that I think is just mean that they have been funded for seven years, so that's yeah, Berkeley. Exactly. But apart from that, there's another thing, and it's this one. They remove the number of pages in which they were searching. That had been, I don't know if you, you remember, it was, you know, um, now everyone has forgotten about it, but for a long time there was this big competition between Google and Yahoo uh, on about who were, which search engine were indexing more pages. Like, and every week they would publish, we are indexing five trillion pages, we are indexing five, blah, blah, blah. Um, and on September 2000, 2005, sorry, not 2015, <laughs> Google said, uh, in fact, we don't care, right? What is important is not how many pages we're indexing. Because we're not indexing, we're only indexing a small fraction of the, of the web anyway. And that's good because we, you know, our users are not interested in the whole web anyway. So what is important is that the first five results are relevant. 
which remind us that we have to take the metaphor of data mining seriously. When we say data mining and we refer to mining, if you think of what mining is, it's like sort of throwing away 99.9% .9 of dirt to keep the only 0.1% of gold or whatever. That's interesting. And when we are talking about digital data or digital traces, to be more precise, they look more like it's often said the information is new oil. It's actually a misunderstanding because it gives you the idea that you just drill somewhere and there's data flowing up easily and sort of almost for free. This is not the case. Uh, digital data resemble much more to unconventional data like oil sand and all this. They're dirty. They, they require huge infrastructure. They're complicated. They have to be clean and they have to be extraction. Without this work of extraction, there's actually no or very little value in digital traces. An example is this map of the web, um, which is, to my knowledge, the most uh, exhaustive uh, map of the web that exists right now. Uh, it contains a few millions of websites. Each of this point here, the circle is a website. Um, and it's also useless. Because there are only two things that you can, it's, it's very nice to look at, but there are only two things that you can learn from this map, uh, which are not very uh, surprising. The first is one, the first is that um, websites that share the same language tend to cite each other. That's why you have the yellow, which is, I think, China cluster here, and you have the uh, blue, light blue cluster here, which is um, English speaking website. And then this, I think, is Brazilian, Portuguese. Except this is French, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's, that, that has been known for a long time. Um, and the other thing is that is the power law of the web, the fact that there are uh, some websites that receive, very few websites receive most of the attention. And there you see there are very huge websites. Uh, the size is the number of links <coughs> that each website receives. And there are a few ones that are very, very big, and, and a lot of that are very, very tiny. But that was, has been known for a lot of time. So if you want a good map of the web, that is a good map of the web. This is produced for Le Monde, uh, the French newspaper, by a company called Linkfluence. And it's only, it's specifically, it's not the web. So it doesn't even sort of try to map the web. It concentrates, focuses on a very specific part of the web, which is the French political blogosphere. So it's a tiny map, it's only... Uh, 1,400 1, websites, almost 5,500 websites, uh, and they're only bl political blogs. But since they have done the job to manually select those few websites, then this map can show us interesting things. And to give you an example of the sort of findings that we can see in this map, is that the um, extreme right and extreme left have a very different profile in the French blogosphere. The, the extreme right is bulk, it's very, there are a lot of blogs, uh, but it's also marginal. See, it's, it's here. They tend, to be a very, they tend to be very connected among themselves, but it's connected from the rest of the blogosphere. The extreme left, on the contrary, uh, is composed by fewer websites, but they are spread all around, and they play a very important role, which is some way unexpected, in sort of bridging the discussion between left and right. So when you think about which type of data you're looking for, sometimes it's not you know, the question of how much, how big the data set is, is, is less important than how interesting it is, how diverse it is, how it opens up observation that could have could have not could have not been done anywhere else. So for example, to talk about climate change in a project that we have done in the Media Lab, uh, we wanted to map the climate negotiation and we hesitated a lot if we uh, were going to go for Twitter or for the Earth Negotiation Bulletin and eventually we decided the Earth Negotiation Bulletin because it's much more specific. Like Twitter is much, of course, it contains much, much, much more data, but the data is less specific, so 
possibly less interesting. And so this is what we end up producing, and that is what is the UN is producing on Twitter, which is also very interesting, of course. I will come back to that, uh, to that image in a minute. So the third um, misunderstanding is that digital is not automatic. Doing the digital research is not just pushing a button, right? Sometimes we, we hope uh, in the academia, at least in the social sciences, um, so when people come to the media lab and ask us how we can help them, uh, most of the time they, they'd expect that we would have like sort of solution that they will make le their life easier. It is not the case, right? Uh, digital traces will make your life even more complicated uh, because precisely this work of extraction that is necessary. To produce the map that I showed you before, this one, this little image and this little page, uh, we had to go through this super complex uh, protocol, that, which I will explain very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we extracted, we, we took all the, EMP, the PDF of the Earth Negotiation Bulletin, then we selected the part that, only the one that were about COPS, Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC, then we cleaned out only the section that were about COPS, because some, sometimes it's mixed up and you get uh, also other things. Then we identified terms, uh, for example, names of countries or negotiation groups, or uh, noun phrases that refers to notion uh, mobilizing the, in the negotiation, for example, climate rate disaster, or financial resources, etc., etc. Then we extracted those terms from uh, the bulletin, from the part of the bulletin that we kept, uh, trying to find all the different sort of variants, linguistic variants for that. Then we went back to uh, the bulletin, we read all of them, and we claimed up uh, the term that we extracted, so we sort of look at which term actually means something and which other uh, were too ambiguous for bringing sense. Uh, then we merge the term that, me that meant the same thing. Uh, for example, you know, technology transfer can be said in many, many different ways. Uh, so we merge all of them, and then we build this other map that shows each little point here is one of the terms that we kept after the cleaning. And they are connected if they appear in the same paragraph of the EMB. And so we could detect uh, this sort of thematic distribution of these terms in the uh, climate negotiation. And so we, we, we sort of detect these different clusters of noun phrases. There's one about the modest NRTC, one about greenhouse gas emission, one about the Kyoto Protocol, etc. Et and then we use, so the fact that these words appear often together is not, is not decided by us. We found it in the Earth Negotiation Bulletin. So then we could use each of these clusters of words as a sort of dictionary to identify a specific topic in the, uh, the negotiation. And then we, what we did was, an, was a network sort of time analysis of the appearance, the occurrence of each of these themes in the negotiation so that we can then trace how much uh, in each cup each of the theme or, uh, was discussed. And this is the map that I showed you before, just to give you an example. This is the, 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 uh, the pink pinkish string here is the post-Kyoto agreement. And of course, it becomes irrelevant when it's starting from 2005 to 2006. And then it gets very important. This one is uh, climate change, the, blue, the light blue here. This is a climate change impact. They're very visible at the end, but not discussed at all from the beginning, et cetera, et cetera. But that was not enough. That was not finished. From that, we also have to build a narration. So we have to tell a story about this, because otherwise the, the visualization by itself doesn't really say a lot. And so the, then we write this whole thing that you can find online on the here, climabs.eu, which is a, a platform that pr we produce at the end uh, of the um, of this project, and that contains this story about climate negotiation and five others. And there's a couple of paper that you can read about it. Um, and I'm almost done, but the last uh, misunderstanding, which is possibly more relevant for those of you that are in social sciences, which is definitely more relevant for those, is that more quantification demands more qualification. 
that's um, rooted in the methods that we use in social sciences this is this distinction between qualitative methods and quantitative methods that you probably have heard of um, qual qualitative methods anthropology, direct observation uh, in-depth uh, questions that allows you to collect intensive data meaning rich data but about very little population and quantitative data, statistics, pools uh, allows you to collect extensive data meaning poor data but on large population and for a long time there has been this when you enter the social, when you enter the social sciences even when I entered the social science, when I entered my PhD, I sort of had to choose by my supervisor were you want to do qualitative or quantitative um, and the good, the interesting thing about digital methods is that it allows you to uh, completely overcome this uh, distinction and I have an example here will I go there if I click? yeah, nice okay, oh, but it doesn't show up Maybe I have to move it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a project that we did in Media Lab. Unfortunately, it's in French, but I will drive you through uh, very quick. So it's about, uh, it's not about climate change or environmental data. It's about law. It's called La Fabrique de la Loi, the, the, the fabric of law, the industry of law. And it, sh it, it, it tries to um, answer the question that you see there, does members' department do the law? or not, because uh, you probably know in political science there's a big discussion about whether laws are actually made in the parliaments or they're just passed through the parliaments but in fact imposed by governments. And so we look at this in the French parliament and we built this uh, database that contains more than, that contains about 900, uh, two, sorry, 290 low text. You can see them here, you can filter them or see all of them, this is only 2013 or we can see all of them okay, so here are the 300 laws discussed in the last four years in the French parliament and you can see them in different ways for example, this more interesting is the quantitative way here, where you would, s you, would, you would see how much time each law spent in each part of the parliament, so the Assemblée Nationale, the Senate uh, and the different commission. Um, so that's a very aggregate view, so that's a very quantitative, if you want, view of uh, these laws and you can compare very easily in one, in one uh, screen of your computer 300 laws, but then we can start drilling down and we can click on this one, for example, this one is a um, homosexual wedding, big controversy in France and here we have again very aggregated information about this law. We know that there have been 9,000 amendments that have been uh, submitted, that only 0.47% have been accepted, that the, the size of the text has decreased, which is strange, uh, of 37% and other, and other information. But we can click on uh, explore the articles and now we will see all the articles of the law at different stages of the law discussion in the different uh, parts, branches of the parliament and when you move your mouse on each of them they will tell you how much it has been changed so this one has been added at this part but if you go to this one for example article 1 B, B it has been modified by 80% at this stage and if we, if we click on it here I will see the modification so I, I have the versioning of the article, say which part has been added, which part has been removed, a little bit as you would have in Wikipedia. And you have that for every article of every law at every stages of the discussion. If I click on another one, it will say here. But we can do better, we can click on explore the am amendments. And here we will see all the amendments that have been submitted, well this is on this specific article let me click on here so we see more these are all the amendments that have been uh, submitted to the law but I can do it article by article at this specific stage and I can see by which uh, 
party they've been uh, submitted and which are their final destinies. They've been accepted or they've been rejected. Most of them are rejected, of course. And if I click on each of these things, for example, this one, I can actually read the, amend the amendments and the people who sign it and when it has been uh, submitted, etc., etc. But I can do better. Again, I can click on this little thing here. And now I can see data on the discussion about these amendments. So I can see how many words have been spoken by different groups, parliamentary groups, at each stage on each article, oh, sorry, on each amendment on each article at each stage of the discussion. So if I click on this one, I see that the UMP, for example, has spoken those many words this, on this amendment, this state, blah, blah, blah. And I see the people. So as you can see who actually spoke those words. And I can do better. I can click on lire les interventions, read the intervention. And I can actually read the verbatim of what they have said. Right? So the point is, back to the presentation. The point is, in a few clicks, like four clicks, five clicks, I can go from a super aggregated view on this data to the verbatim of the word spoken in uh, the parliament. And it's this possibility to navigate through datascape that is sort of dissolving the uh, distinction between qualitative and quantitative data. In a sense, it has always been possible right, to disaggregate the data I come back to the original data, but it took a lot of time. It took to go back to the archive, to find out the original collection of this, blah, blah, blah. Now you can do that quickly enough, and that changes everything. Um, how do I? OK, so this thing you can read. Um, so why does it, why, what is that? And then I, co I will conclude on this one. So why is this important, this uh, sort of overcoming this qualitative quantitative distinction. The reason why it is important is that this qualitative quantitative distinction has for a long time in the social sciences be connected to another distinction that is about what's called the micro level and the macro level. So the micro level would be the level of individual interaction, right? Individual choices of consumption, for example. And the macro level would be the level of social structures like big institution, uh, like you know, the markets, the market economy. And sociologists have for a long time, and still most of them think that um, these two things exist on two separate levels. But they, they, these are two different levels of existence. Right? And what we are trying to push at the Media Lab is the idea that it might not be the case, that it might be only a sort of an artifact of this, of this divided vision of this strabismus that we had so far. And that is particularly important, I think, um, in the case of environmental debate, because when we're talking about, for example, climate change, we see it very quick, very well working this EMAPS project. Um, you could either, you know, probably so the, the most important discussion do not take place neither at the level of the individual citizens, nor at the level of uh, the big global structure. But it's, what, what is happening is, is what the debate is all about, the, it takes place in between, in all the multiple sort of intermediary bodies and institutions and groups and occasion and meetings that, that exist between this micro and macro, which were very difficult to observe with the traditional conventional method of social sciences, which are becoming uh, open to observation. Thank you to digital methods. Thank you.